Thanks to UP Travel for supporting this video. Hey there! Let's get on a boat! At the far eastern edge of Michigan's Upper Peninsula is Drummond Island. It's one of the largest lake islands in the US, and the main way to get here is by hopping on a ferry. There are no bridges connecting the island to the mainland. Historically, Drummond Island is full of stories. For thousands of years, indigenous peoples were the only humans here. Fast forward to the 1800s, and according to local historians, this was the site of the last active British fort in the United States, established after the War of 1812. Fast forward again, and today Drummond Island is home to about a thousand people, plus a lot of visitors who are into off-roading, hiking, birding, kayaking, and all that good outdoor stuff. But what I came here to see was the island itself. Drummond Island is home to one of the rarest habitats in the world, and it's also home to the most fossil-filled outcrop I have ever been to. So it's story time. Geologically, Drummond Island is mostly made of the mineral dolomite, an altered type of limestone that has lots of magnesium in it. It's used in various industrial jobs, including steel making, and there's a significant dolomite quarry on the island. Also, as a fun side note, a rock formation called the Niagara Escarpment goes through Drummond Island, which is the same rock formation that Niagara Falls tumbles over. In any case, this is where we'll begin our story, with the dolomite on Drummond Island, or rather, the limestone it came from. Limestone can form without life, but it can also form from the remains of calcium-rich materials like shells. When these remains settle on the seafloor, they eventually become buried and get compressed and become rock. That's why you often see limestone in places that used to be covered by seas or oceans in the distant past. And for the same reason, you also find it in Michigan. For millions of years, this part of the world was repeatedly flooded by warm, relatively shallow saltwater seas, which were full of corals and all kinds of other interesting critters. Well, I'd heard you could visit one of those ancient coral reefs somewhere on Drummond Island, at least as long as you could get there. I was advised that the path out was full of jagged rocks and deep puddles, and I don't own a vehicle equipped for off-roading. So we rented one. And here I do want to say a very large thank you to Beavers on Drummond Island for setting us up for success with so many good directions. I genuinely had a wonderful experience with them. Now, before you get to the fossil ledges, you have to drive through the northern part of the island. And that means you get to drive through a rare kind of habitat and see the phenomenon that introduced me to Drummond Island in the first place. This is the Maxton Plains Preserve, and it's an alvar. Alvars are a type of habitat that forms on broad, flat sections of calcium-rich bedrock, like limestone or dolomite. And they usually have very thin layers of soil, like less than a foot thick. That means alvars often flood in the spring and dry out real fast in the summer. And these harsh conditions mean they often can't support huge trees, although alvar woodlands are also a thing. At Maxton Plains, though, the landscape is dominated by grasses and grass-like plants called sedges, with some shrubs thrown in if you're lucky. I was very surprised to learn that this environment only shows up in a few regions around the world. The Baltic region of Northern Europe, some islands off the coast of Sweden, Ireland and the UK, and the Great Lakes region south of the Canadian Shield, where we are. And according to the Nature Conservancy, who runs this preserve, the alvars on Drummond Island are the largest remaining high-quality alvars in North America. So without meaning to, I had ended up somewhere special. Of course, this place isn't as, like, visually grand as some habitats, but I think it's beautiful in its own way. In October, when I was there, this place was broad and quiet and invited you to go take a walk and watch the birds. But before I knew about any of this, what actually drew me to this place was a call with my in-laws, who wanted to know about this. At first, I thought this was an old parking lot or like maybe a foundation, so I reached out to the local visitors bureau and just asked. But they reported back that, nope, this spot is not paved, 
that's just how it is. This is a particularly exposed section of bedrock, and it could maybe be considered a specific type of alvar, called alvar pavement. This is where there's basically no soil over the bedrock. Instead, sediment collects in the cracks, and that's where plants grow. Maybe unsurprisingly though, what stood out to me is that a lot of these cracks are pretty regular. It's not as neat as the wall I saw in the Keweenaw Peninsula last year. A lot of the cracks go off in sort of random, jagged looking directions, and they're much smaller, but it still caught my eye. It really looks like a human-made foundation. Ultimately though, it turns out that the most special thing about this place might actually just be how scraped clean the bedrock is. There are lots of examples in nature of rocks like this cracking in semi-regular patterns. When they're exposed to stress and force, they break along lines of weakness, and exactly how they break will depend on the stress and on the rock's structure. One thing I do want to point out, though, is that this is definitely not the coolest example of Alvar pavement. While I was trying to understand this site, I learned that in other places, like in England, these cracks can get dramatic thanks to plants and rainwater. As rain falls, it picks up carbon dioxide and becomes a very weak form of carbonic acid. But over time, that acid is still enough to dissolve deep valleys in the cracked limestone. In any case, this Alvar was not my last stop. We got back on the side-by-side -side and pressed on and quickly understood why the Visitors Bureau recommended we run to side-by-side -side in the first place. But man, was it worth it. Because not only are the fossil ledges a beautiful stretch of Lake Huron shore, but there are an obscene number of fossils here. Evidence that this was once a coral reef was embedded in nearly every rock we touched and arranged in what seemed like textbook-worthy formations in the ledges themselves. Like, look at these! You, you can see where fossils were deposited, and then time passed, and then came more fossils. The ledges also extend into the water, so there's even more to see with a kayak. From what I could find research-wise, this area seems to be from the late Ordovician period, from about 444 to 458 million years ago. If I could go back in time to this spot, well, the Earth is a very active place and land masses move around, so I would actually have to go south of the equator. But once I got here, this place might have looked something like the tropics. At the fossil ledges, I found tons and tons of coral, I found lots of shells, and I found plenty of fragments I couldn't identify. Doing some research, I even learned through the University of Michigan Museum of Paleontology that part of an extinct cephalopod was found on Drummond Island. So a diversity of sea creatures lived here, and you could easily spend hours exploring this place. which. We probably would have if our noses had not been going numb in the October wind. Really though, this brings us full circle, because over time these sea creatures died and their remains were compressed with other sediment and they became limestone and that limestone became dolomite. Millions of years later, that dolomite was scraped clean by glaciers and became the foundation for the Alvar habitat and most of what we see on Drummond Island today. So the world changes, and life changes, and civilizations change. There are layers to every story, and I've only touched on a couple of them here. But even for a weekend, it's pretty magical to see what you can learn. There is a lot of public information available about the fossil ledges, so this is not a secret spot. But nonetheless, I do often feel hesitant about sharing about places like this in a public video, because I don't want to see these spots tarnished. So here I ask that if you do make the trek out, to please treat this place kindly and take only photos. It is better to leave this place as it is than to have a couple of dusty decorations on your bookshelf. But you are watching a nature and science video and you're lovely people, so you know what's up. So for now, Thanks for being here, and thanks to UP Travel for supporting this video. You can learn more about Drummond Island and the rest of the Upper Peninsula at uptravel.com, and can follow them on social media for tips for planning a visit. Thanks as always for being here. 
I hope you learned something that makes you think about the world just a little differently, and I'll see you soon.